Good morning, Ave South. How is everybody? You good? All right, it's St. Patrick's Day, so I'm looking for the green, but I won't be a hypocrite because I'm not wearing any either, okay? Um, and if you want to be Irish, I suppose that counts as well, okay? So we'll give you a pass today. We're glad that you're here this morning. I've met a couple of guests. The, the fact that you would carve out time out of a busy weekend, whatever you've got ahead of you today or getting ready for Monday morning, like we're just grateful that you're here. And so always you honor us with your presence. Let us know how we can honor you. We're always down front after the services or at the welcome desk in the atrium. Please come see us. Over the next few minutes, just as we've worshiped and sung and prayed together, we're going to worship through reading God's word together. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, I hope you'll join me in the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy. I'll put this up on the screen here in just a minute. But I always want you to have a copy. You can look at it on your phone. You can have an old school version, hardback Bible. Um, we want you to become a creature of the word and uh, to read it for yourself, especially the other six days when we're not gathered on Sunday morning. And uh, speaking of which, we've been in a chronological Bible reading plan. And so as a church, we started in Genesis. We will finish in Revelation. And this past week... We finished the book of Deuteronomy. We finished the book of Deuteronomy. It's the first five books of the Bible. That's hard for a lot of us. Like we, we run into Leviticus and Deuteronomy and we just, we hit walls and barriers. And if you've made it this far, like well done, don't grow weary in doing good. And if you need to catch up, then certainly a Sunday afternoon or maybe tomorrow morning is a good day to do that. But we're going to be in the last few chapters of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And this chapter, as we kind of conclude the, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, um, Moses is about to leave God's people. He, he's about to slip into eternity. He's, he's about to lay down in eternal rest. And before he dies, he kind of huddles everybody up on the plains of Moab. Like this is, would be like a huge worship service. And he's going to remind them of what matters most before they get to the promised land. Past several weeks, we've seen God's people wandering through the wilderness, and right before they get into the promised land, he kind of huddles them up, and he reminds them of what is most important in their relationship with God. And that's, really, that's really good counsel, because right before you get into everything you've ever wanted, um, these are the important reminders. And you know, for me, when, when I was a college freshman, um, my, my dad dropped me off um, at school, and I can't remember why I didn't have my, my car with me, but I remember dad dropped me off. And one of the things he shared with me, um, my dad doesn't make a lot of speeches, and he's not overly emotional as, as, as a dude, um, but, but he's sincere, and he's a godly man. And as I grabbed all my stuff and started walking towards my dorm, he looked at me and he said, hey, everything that you want out of life's right in front of you. He, he's like, academically, athletically, like, you're, you're flourishing as a person. Like, it, it, God is so good, and he's so faithful, and it's all right there in front of you. And, and he said, the enemy also has a plan for your life. And he would love to just chew up and steal everything God has for you. And so my dad, standing right there in the parking lot of my dorm, said, um, choose God. Like, choose God. And so it was, like, it was like, wow, what prompted him to do that? And, I, you know, I had something to think about for several weeks there. Um, but I was so grateful for the simplicity of a, of a dad who just chose to step out and say, like, you got two choices in front of you. You can choose God or you can choose other things. Choose God. Because that's where flourishing is. And, and look, times change. The text we're about to read happened thousands of years ago. That story in my life happened some couple of decades ago. And today is St. Patrick's Day 2024. Time and centuries may change, but God's truth is timeless. And it's always helpful and living and active. And the same truth is in front of you and me today. you got two choices, church. You can choose God and life or you can wander away from him and walk into things that you never anticipated for your life. And Moses' main point of his sermon here is, choose God and enjoy life. So that's exactly what we're going to see in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want you to remain seated while we walk through this. We're going to start in verse 11, and we're going to go through 20. We're just going to go through about 9 or 10 verses here, but let's start in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 30. This is Moses speaking as God's mouthpiece. So these are God's words to his people. It says, this command that I give you today is certainly not too difficult or beyond your reach. It's not in heaven so that you have to ask who's going to go up to heaven and get this truth for us and proclaim it in a way that we may follow it. Verse 13, and this command I'm about to give you is not across the sea so that you have to ask who will cross the sea and get it for us and come back and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. Verse 14, 
but the message is very near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart so that you may follow it. Let's pause right there for just a moment as we kind of chew this, this passage just a little bit, kind of verse by verse. One of the things that you discover in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy is there's, there's a lot going on, and sometimes bite-sized chunks of the truth are digestible and they're helpful. And so it may be good for us as we finish up Deuteronomy here in chapter 30 to kind of pause for a minute as we walk through these nine or ten verses and just kind of process it together as a people. One of the things that God is telling his people here is he's giving them a command. This command that I give you today. So remember, they're huddled up on the plains of Moab. They're about to go into the promised land. And God's saying, I'm going to give you a command before you enter the land that I've told you about. Before you enter into the area which I've told you will be a place of rest. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Everything you've ever wanted and really needed in relationship with me and with each other, it's right in front of you. And before you go there, I want to give you a command. And here's what you and I need to know. Moses is talking to a group of people who are in a covenant relationship with God. They're in a covenant relationship with God. Do you remember what Moses said when he described God placing a call on Abraham's life? Like, Father Abraham, these are his descendants, the Israelites. Abraham was commanded by God to go to a land that he had never been. It was unseen and to trust that what God was telling him was true. And so Abraham placed his faith in the promises of God, what God told him to do. And Moses tells us in the Bible that his faith was credited to him as righteousness. So we are people of faith. The way we enter into a right, proper relationship with God is through faith. And for those of us on this side of Jesus' finished work, on the cross at Calvary and by the power of the resurrection, we've placed our faith in Jesus as our perfection, as our sufficiency. He is everything that we want to be and are not able to because we're sinful and broken and flawed. And some of us may, may realize that, and others of us are may just becoming aware of that. But we've come to place our faith in Jesus Christ, and so we enter into a right relationship with God. So Moses is talking to a group of people in similar fashion that are in relationship with God through their faith. And so a command, I want, to, I want to make sure we all understand this. He's not commanding them to obey something so that they'll be in a relationship with him. What he's saying to them is, listen, I'm going to give you something that if you choose to obey it will determine the quality and the enjoyment of your relationship with me and your relationship with each other and your potential flourishing in the land of Canaan. We're in relationship. But I'm about to give you a command that will determine how well you enjoy life in the years and decades ahead. And so in reality, anytime you see in a passage this command that I give you, and there's a lot of them in the first five books of the Bible, there's an implication like God won't force his people to obey his commands. I totally love this about God, and I hope you do too. He won't manipulate you. He won't force you to love him. He won't force you to obey him. So he's going to put a choice in front of his people. And this is no different than Adam and Eve. They had a choice. You can choose to obey me or you can choose to disobey me. If you read the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament, like it's full of Jesus teaching like, hey, if you'll do these things and live in this way according to what God says is best for you, you will have life and flourish. If you don't, then here's what could happen in your life. Like all throughout Scripture, the theme is consistent. Choices will lead you either to flourishing or they will lead you towards things that are not good for you. And that's exactly what he says. Look at verse 15. We talk about Nick saying just a moment ago when he was reading and, and leading the songs, like how important it is to just be clear and simple and straightforward. God puts the cookies on the lowest shelf for us. Verse 15, today I have put before you two choices, life and prosperity or death and adversity. Now this is about as clear and as simple as it gets. And one of the realities is that God is so gracious. This is the first thing I want you to think about today. God is so gracious to make clear the choices before us. It is God's grace to say, hey, here's, here's what matters in life. I'm going to make this as clear as I can. It is his grace to us. And God will honor whatever decisions and choices you make. Like that is totally fair. That is totally 
just of God to say, I'm going to be very clear with what matters most, and whatever you choose to do, whether you choose to obey or disobey, I will honor and accept your choices. And that's what he's putting in front of God's people here. That's what he puts in front of us today. And so I've set before you life and prosperity or death and adversity. And so in verse 16, he kind of lays it out for us. What's going to lead to life and what's going to lead to death? Because those are the two choices that they have, and those are the two choices that you and I have today. Verse 16, for I'm commanding you today, love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, and keep his commands, statutes, and ordinances, so that you may live and multiply and the Lord God may bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. So this is God through Moses saying there's two doors in front of you. Door number one is life. And here's how you get there. If you want to choose life, you love the Lord your God, you walk in his ways, you keep his commands. And by the way, like this, this is not stuff they haven't heard, right? If you've been in the Bible reading plan, you've been in Deuteronomy. This shows up in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And, and, and here's what you need to do. Obey his commands, memorize his commands, hide them in your heart, tell them to your children, write them on the doorpost of your homes. Like, do everything you can to honor and worship him through your love for him and obedience to him. So if you've been reading with us, you know this is nothing new. Like, this shouldn't be shocking to them. And, and one of my friends who writes songs, one of, one of the best lyrics he's ever written, is he wrote that, like, sometimes we don't need new information. We just need to believe and live as if we trust what we already know. And so this isn't some new mic drop sermon moment for Moses. Before we get into the promised land, everything God's ever promised is in front of us. Choose life by loving him and obeying him and following him. And he says, this is with a promise, so that the Lord God may bless you. Blessing will come with it. And I do want to say this, when he laid the choices in front of him, choose life, prosperity, I want to make sure there's a lot of prosperity gospel in North American and Western culture. God's not saying like, follow me and I'll give you everything you've ever wanted. Prosperity or blessing means to have as much of God's presence as you want. That's what it means. Now, sometimes God allows us to enjoy houses or cars or trips or vacations or whatever. Like, that's not what this is implying. That's part of life, sure. But he's saying, like, you will enjoy having so much of God with you if you'll just follow and obey and pursue him. And so this, again, isn't something that they haven't heard. But it's always a good reminder to be told this. Your enjoyment in life and your flourishing is totally up to you. Like, I want you to think about that. He's saying, like, I'm going to be faithful. But how well you flourish, you get to determine that. It's in your hands. And that's where they get to take ownership of their faith. That's where you and I get to take ownership of our faith. It's up to us how much we want to enjoy him, right? Because he is there. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. When you woke up this morning, he was not dozing. He was aware. He was singing praises over us like you can have as much of God and flourish as you want to. But he says conversely, right? Here's the two choices. There's life and there's death. Look at what he says in verse 17 and 18. But if your heart turns away, and that's pretty important. Some of you have your pens, and, and I see you writing right now. You can underline, or you can circle your heart. But if your heart turns away, and you do not listen, and you're led astray to bow and worship to other gods and serve them, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you. And this, remember, like, let's go with that metaphor of a dad. Uh, and I know not all of us have, have a dad that we love or respect. So anytime we're talking about God as a father, let me be very clear to say, like, he created and came up with that picture of, of a father to a child who, who wants the best for them, will not fail them, is always going to make the decisions that will help them flourish in relationship with him. So when we talk about God as a father, like it's the best thing that could happen for the child. And so when we talk about a father talking to his child, think about a dad who's like this. Look, I will tell you today, that's what's here, like, hey, I'm just going to tell it to you straight. I just want to be very plain with you here. If you, if you quit listening to me and you let your heart be captivated by things other than me, it's going to lead you where you don't want to go. And it could lead to your death. It could ultimately destroy you in the land that you're entering to possess. Now, when I read passages like this, I'm like, well, well I mean, who would choose death? How many of us right here, if God showed up, materialized right here and said, choose life or choose death, who wants to come up to this mic and be like, I will choose death. I'll go first, guys. 
Who's going to do that? You and I aren't, right? We're not going to be like, I will choose what's not good for me. Um, how, how do you get there? Well, well, for them, it was the temptation of worshiping other gods. And like I told you, like captivating your heart is so important. But if you let your heart, here's, here's what I want you to know. Choices, obedience, outward obedience, uh, it, it has to happen. You, you make decisions, you do things outwardly, sure. But it's always after your heart is captivated by the thing that you're obeying or choosing to pursue. So let me give you an example. Uh, we're coming back from the beach this past Friday. Been down there for a baseball tournament uh, with my son and the whole family's in the car, and we stopped in Birmingham, and we stopped uh, like at our favorite pizza place. And so we stop, and we get out, and when we get out of the car, um, the, the boys get out, and uh, there was a, t a table of young ladies, probably college freshmen from around the corner, and they're, they're sitting here at this table, and I get out, and I notice they look at my sons as we walk by. I didn't think much of it, but we go a couple of, of shops down, we go into the restaurant. And um, my oldest son sits down at the table with us, and his sister and my freshman son are playing kind of video games at this arcade at this restaurant. And um, my, my son, who's 16, comes back and he said, um, hey, when we got out of the car, um, uh, apparently this young lady saw you, Silas, and she uh, wants your phone number. And um, so he was like, oh, okay, all right. And I did get his permission to tell this story. Um, <laughs> always do that before I kind of out my kids like that. Um, and he was like, Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess I'm fine with that. And so, you know, um, he shares the information. Here is her friends, the one who wants you. Here's her friend's number. And you can text her to give her your number and she'll give it to your friends. It's like, okay, whatever. And so he's like, sure, whatever. And he passes that along and he texts back and they start this text thread. And so while we're eating pizza, um, you know, there's a little texting going on and we're all kind of like, what is that? You know, like we, they don't even know each other. Like <laughs> what is happening here? And so, like, well, where, where does she go to school? Oh, she does. She, she's in school here in the city. Okay, cool. And, like, where's she from? Okay. And, like, what is she into? And, like, do y'all know any mutual people? And so then they, they start, you know, snapping each other and, like, talking to each other and all kind of stuff. And it's going well. And my freshman son said, hey, 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 hold on. Did you ask her if she's a Christian? And, and um, Silas is like, I, I haven't even laid eyes on her. I haven't even met her. Like, it's, time out, brother. Like, literally, my brother, like, give me a break. And, and Isaiah said, because you, you know, uh, at some point you got to ask that. And, and, you know, we didn't like, I didn't put on pastor hat and be like, that's wonderful, son, because whom you choose to marry, whether they worship God or not, <laughs> you could give yourself to them. And they might not worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, I didn't, I didn't do all that. <laughs> and so Amy and I just, we just kept eating our pizza, you know, just watching this play out. And, um, but, but we did talk about it in the car. And the boys talked about it. And it's kind of cool to see your sons as young men, 18 and 16, talking about dating and how do you work into the conversation? Is she a believer? Is she not? Like, because we're going to maybe have different priorities if she's not and if I'm not or whatever. And um, the reality for God's people, here, like that, that, we all got a good laugh out of that just now, right? But like one of the things that keeps showing up over and over in Deuteronomy, just, just one, like how, why, why would anybody choose death? You wouldn't willingly choose it. But one of the things that keeps showing up in Deuteronomy is that the men, the Israelites, were, were going to be tempted to marry women that weren't from their tribe. A, a beautiful woman or somebody they meet, and they're like, I want to get to know her. And he's like, you're going to be tempted to marry them. And if you marry them and start worshiping their gods, they don't worship me. And some of the pagan gods that, that, that they worshiped required child sacrifice. That's so not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's for life and the dignity from the pre-born to the senior adult, like at death's doorstep. Like, and if you worship them, you might love them so much, you might start committing yourself. Because if your heart's captivated, talk about two teenagers talking about young love, right? And your heart being captivated by dating life and marriage and all that, right? That's legit. If your heart's captivated by someone, you might also give your heart to their gods. And you wake up one day, and you never woke up and said, today I will destroy my life. I mean, nobody does that, right? I, I, to, I'm going to destroy Who in this room woke up today and said, you know what, St. Patrick says, a good day to destroy my marriage is a good day to wreck my relationship with my kids for the rest of our lives on earth. We don't do that, do we? But we slowly give our hearts to other false gods and idols and things that accidentally, well, they, they vary intentionally because the enemy's got a plan, but unknowing to us, perhaps, they pull us and one little step at a time you, you can either take one step of obedience each day towards the Lord or one step away, and you look up after 365 days and 52 weeks and 10 years and a decade and five decades, and you look up and you're like, man, I'm so far away 
from what I know to be right, know to be true, and I'm not flourishing the way I thought, and I never saw this coming. You ever made a decision, you end up right by me, you're like, how did I get here? Like, that's fair, that's legit, but like, that's how it happens. So for them, that was their temptation. Like, listen, you got to protect what captivates your heart. In the book of Proverbs 4, 23, it says, protect the heart for it's the wellspring of life. Be careful what you give your heart to. And God is so kind and good to say, here's the temptation. But if you know the enemy's strategy and plan, you don't have to be caught off guard like a boxer who never saw that left hook coming. And it may not be dating. It may not be worshiping false idols, right? Because you start dating somebody who, who worships a false god. It's tax season. I'm so sorry. That's probably the most discouraging thing you've heard in this sermon. You got about 28 days, turn your taxes in. And you may be tempted, just one little thing, not a big deal, but tempted to compromise your integrity by not claiming or, or not noting salary, what, whatever it may be. Like, so it could be your dating life. It could be your character and integrity in, in your finances, your stewardship, whatever it may be. Everybody's life in here is different, but like you got choices in front of you. And every little choice matters. Even the little ones matter because all of those add up to either choosing life and following God and flourishing or slowly but surely choosing to wander away from him. And that's why he said, if you don't listen to me and your heart turns, and oftentimes when we pray, Lord, what, what do I say sometimes? Like if, if we stand, read the text and say, open the eyes and the ears of our hearts to hear and to see your truth. Doing the chronological Bible reading plan is one of the best things you can do, and it may not feel super spiritual, and I'm going to do the read. Like, you're opening the eyes and the ears of your heart to his voice and you're tuning your heart to the sound of God's voice, and you're learning to love him and just be with him. And, and so there are things that you can do, but everybody in this room's got choices, just like they did in front of us, and choices that lead to life and choices that lead to death. And I think God is so good and faithful to say, here's where these things lead, and I will honor whatever you say or whatever you choose. But I told you, choosing life or death is not solely about outward obedience. It always starts from within. It always starts from within. It's a matter of the heart, what captivates your heart. So who has your heart today? Like, who has captivated your heart? If you're a follower of God, like, has God captivated your heart? I don't see him in this room. Maybe, maybe Nick is in here, but when he sings and, like, he gets emotional, or I'm reading a text or preaching, I get emotional. Like, man, my heart, his heart, our heart just kept, like, God, you're so good. My heart has moved emotionally, sure. But, like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, like, What's captured your heart when you read the word and when you spend time thinking about like, I'm a sinner in need of God's grace and his forgiveness and I know where I am without him. When you preach the gospel to yourself daily, your heart falls more in love with God and it captivates, the good news of God captivates it more and more and tethers you to him. And if you're like, I want to choose life, I want to choose what's, what's right and will lead to my flourishing, but I'm not strong enough, I'm not good enough and I'm not a pastor, I'm not a worship leader, like I'm not a small group leader, I don't know if I can do this. Well, you're right where you need to be. Because just like those 12 spies in Numbers 13, half of them were like, we can't do this. And that's right where they needed to be. You can't, but God can. And so keep reading here with me. What does it say? Look in verse 19. I call on heaven and earth as witnesses against you today. Like, I'm just, hey, I'm going to say it again, Moses said. I'm going to say it loud for the people in the back of the room if they hadn't heard it. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live Parents in the room, your obedience today has implications for your children and their unborn children. It ripples through eternity. You can positively, in a God-honoring way, affect future generations by your obedience today. Choose life today so that future generations can flourish. Verse 20, love the Lord your God and obey him and remain faithful to him. And again, if this is where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. It's hard. Life's hard. I'm up against the grind of choices in life. And nobody understands, like, it says... Remain faithful to God, for he is your life. Maybe you can't, but I can tell you this, God can. I've got a real good friend who had no symptoms recently, none whatsoever. And, and all of a sudden, like out of breath, not feeling good, something not right, pain in his back, he goes, and he's got like four blockages going on at 80 to 90%. And they're like, you're not going home, you're going into open heart today. He's my age. And he's like, what? Don't have family history of this? Like, he's like, you know what's crazy? They put me on a machine that kept me alive during the surgery. And, and, and so neither one of us have a medical degree or background. He's like, just, 
That's crazy, right? Like, it breathed for me. It lived for me. Without that thing, I wouldn't be here while I was in the surgery to help me stand here and tell you this story. And I couldn't help, like I'm reading this text, preparing for this Sunday, and I couldn't help but think, he's like, that machine was my life, and I was tethered to it, and I needed it so badly, and it did for me what I couldn't do for myself. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is your life. In him is life, and that life, as John says, is the light of men. Life is hard, and it's a grind, and it's not easy. And following Jesus doesn't mean that all of our troubles will go away. But guess what? He is able, and he is your life. And not only does God say, choose life, he says, I'm going to help you flourish as you follow me. I got this. And when the Apostle Paul was talking to the church in Rome, you know sometimes when people use somebody else's speech or their sermon or whatever and say, that was really good, I'm going to repeat that, right? Paul's preaching to the church in Rome, and in Romans chapter 10, he's trying to help them understand the same thing we are. Like, you can choose life. You can do this. Because God's going to help you, Christ in you, helping you flourish. And when Paul preached to the church in Rome, does this sound familiar? He said, but the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will go into the abyss, or rather across the sea, as Moses said, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? I mean, he's quoting Moses from Deuteronomy 30. The message is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. You know this message. And some of you in the room, you've been coming to church a long time, you know the answer is Jesus. You know you need Jesus. You know you want a different life. You know you want to flourish with him. And you want the strength to obey and enjoy him and to flourish. And Paul told the church in Rome the same thing I'm telling you. The answer is Jesus. He'll help you choose life. He will be your life. And together for the rest of your life, you get to build a future with him where you can know him and enjoy him forever. And that's what Paul told the church in Rome. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He's like, give your heart to Jesus. Let Jesus captivate your heart. Didn't I tell you that choices, like the choices we make, start with our hearts being moved by something? Those of you that know where you'd be without God and without Jesus, and you want Jesus for the first time ever, give your heart to Jesus today. Say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, be my God. I, I don't even know what that means, but I choose Jesus. Somebody in the room may need to do that today. But every one of us have some choice we're making today. Choice in your marriage. Choice in your dating life. Choice in your relationship with, with your coworkers. Choice collegiately. Choice academically. Choice professionally. Whatever it is, over the next few minutes... I'm encouraging you and challenging you. Like, like Moses said, I put this before you. Choose life. Choose to honor God in those things. Invite him into it. Jesus, you are my life. Be involved in this thing. Help me do what's right. Help me glorify the Father, especially when obedience is so hard and difficult, and nobody else in my little tribe of friends is making choices that lead to life. Help me, Jesus. Oh, that's a prayer he'll answer. He would love to come alongside you and help you. But here's the deal. In the same way, he won't force you to follow him. Like, he's not going to manipulate you to do that. You have to choose. I told you God allows you to make choices. He'll give you that free will for you to choose what you want to do. But when you choose Jesus and he takes up residence in your life, man, that's a game changer. And you not only have his life, the re like, mm, you got Jesus in you, the resurrected life of Jesus, power over sin, power over death, power over the gates of hell, alive and active inside of you. You can't, but Jesus can. Choose life. And it's found through faith in Jesus. So I'm going to invite Nick and the worship team to come back up here, and I'm going to give you a chance to evaluate what captivates your heart and to make choices based on that. So I've given you a couple examples. Today it may be to choose Jesus. There may be some other choice you need to make. But you get the next couple of minutes, just you and God, choosing life or choosing things that lead to death. That may sound blunt, may sound a little harsh, but how good and gracious is God to say, this is really what life's all about. 
So I plead with you like Moses. And I still don't know what prompted my dad at the side of the car to just say, hey, choose to follow God. Don't choose the things of this world. But I'm so glad he did. And I just stand before you passing on what another follower of Jesus shared with me. Choose life. Choose Jesus. Whatever choices you need to make, you take the next 120 seconds or so to do that. I'm always down front. Our staff's here. We can help you. We'll pray with you. We'll go to the kneeling benches, pray where you are. In just a moment, Nick and the team will ask us to stand and sing in response about how good God is to help us with whatever choice we need to make. But you pray to him now.